Hi, you're listening to another message from Sunny Hill Church. Our prayer is that these messages encourage, empower, edify, and equip you to live for Christ in 2023. Be blessed as you listen in. Well, it's good to be with you today. My name's Dom. Uh, I've got the privilege of leading this church with a great team. Uh, if this is your first time, welcome. It's so good to be together. This is a part of the service where we open God's Word together. Think about what the Lord is saying uh, to us. Um, last week, we started a new series that we've called This Is Us. And um, last week, we kind of broke the, the four weeks that I'm going to be speaking down with this analogy of a car that's on a journey. Um, and I spoke about how the car, the chassis, is kind of like what we believe. It, what we believe. It's the thing that, we, that holds us together. It's the thing that protects us. It's the thing that ensures that we are moving in the same direction together. And our beliefs are crucially important to that. Because as I said last week, what you believe determine, determines who you become. And so actually our beliefs are so key. And actually last Sunday night at the prayer meeting, Pete the drummer came up to me. Pete Bastock is his name. Pete the drummer is what he does. Uh, Pete the drummer came to uh, me and says, Dom, that, that was your best preach this year so far. And for a moment, <laughs> for a moment I was blessed. I was like, yeah, come on, smashing it. Realizing that that was the only preach I'd done in 2004, 24. And so I was like, thank you, Pete. You've got a real spirit of encouragement. That's great. Um, hey, there's a, there's a new movie that has uh, just come out uh, called One Life. And I don't know if you've seen it. I haven't seen it yet, but I know kind of some of the story about it. But I've heard from Josh G that uh, he was bawling his eyes through it like it was an emotional film. And really, it's, it's a, the story of uh, pre-World War II which is a massive area of interest for me. I love World War II history. Me and my brother, we're uh, heading to Poland, Auschwitz in March, because we really want to just experience and, and see kind of some of the... I mean, it sounds like a very depressing trip, but I'm really excited because I think, you know, you can go to a museum and see stuff, but I believe that when you go somewhere like Auschwitz, where millions of Jews were uh, exterminated, you don't just see something, you feel something. You feel something of the weight of history. And, and really, uh, this story, One Life, that is just in the cinemas now, it's a story of a man named Nicholas Winton. Uh, he was, my understanding, he's kind of like a banker in London in the mid-30s. And in 1938, he uh, went to Czechoslovakia and he saw the imminent invasion of the Nazis. He knew that there was a forthcoming kind of doom. It wasn't going to be good for the Jews. Um, and so he decided to do something to help thousands of Jewish families who had fled Germany and Austria into Czechoslovakia. He decided to help their children. So between Prague and London, he, ballaged, uh, he badgered politicians and bureaucrats, newspapers, uh, jour journalists, media outlets, the public, and found sponsorship and organized visas for many, many children. Children he didn't know, children he hadn't met, because something in his heart stirred for that need. And so he was finding foster families right across Britain, willing to take Jewish children from Czechoslovakia. And he organized trainloads of kids to travel across Europe, filled with these children. Many trains leaving Prague and, and other places heading towards Britain. And he did as much as he could before the war eventually engulfed the rest of Europe and the world. And for the whole of his life, there's a picture painted of him as a man who struggled with this idea that, like, I could have done more, I could have saved more, not fully knowing what his legacy was, not fully knowing what his impact was. And so he agonized over this idea of, I could have done more, there are more children I could have reached, surely. And he always struggled to come to terms with the idea that some he wasn't able to save. Now, he did this for no acclaim, he did this for no uh, reputation, it was just something he was compelled to do, and so he did it, and he wasn't trying to get in the newspaper, he wasn't trying to become well-known or renowned, and in fact, to be honest, until recently, most people didn't even know his story, like his story flew under the, the radar completely, um, but we'll come back to him in a little while. But it is important for today's uh, message because last week I spoke about what we believe. Today I want to grapple with the question, in light of what we believe, where is it we're going as a church? Where is it that God is calling us to go as a church? Now we are um, compelled and convinced of our 
God preferred future, if you like, by the things we believe about God. And, and what we read in the scriptures is actually God gives people um, dreams, revelations, pictures of a different future to what they're currently living. It's important that we acknowledge that. Like you've got the vision of Abraham, for example. Vision, a vision that didn't uh, come to him till he was the age of 99. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says, Abraham was as good as dead. <laughs> okay, a very brutal descriptor of this man, Abraham. And for those of you who are 99, obviously that's the new 40, so we're all good in the hood. But obviously there was a sense that like Abraham, even though he was old, and even though he was considered past it by uh, societal kind of standards, God decided and determined in his heart that he wanted to do something incredible for Abraham. And so God gave Abraham a vision of a land and a lineage. I mean, the interesting thing about the promise is that the promise is, it's not just daring, it's almost like scientifically, I want to say impossible, but I don't really know biology that well, so I say highly improbable. Because the vision that God gave to Abraham and his older wife was that they were going to have many children. Okay, now he's an old guy. And this is what the writer of Hebrews is really trying to get after, that despite all the things going against Abraham, and even though he was as good as dead, God gave him a vision. God gave him a revelation, a picture of a future that God had for him, even though it seemed highly unlikely. You also have the vision of Moses as well. God revealed himself to Moses through the burning bush and the instruction of the vision and revelation was that Moses was being raised up by God to lead the people of Israel out of bondage in Egypt. And so Moses received a vision of deliverance, a vision of God's redemptive power and Moses faced challenges and doubts for sure but God's vision sustained him through the setbacks, hardships and, and dead ends of life because Moses was holding on holding on to a vision that God's people would enter into the land that God had promised to Abraham, a land of freedom, a land flowing with milk and honey. You also have God reveal himself through vision to Isaiah. In Isaiah 6, the uh, prophet receives this majestic, majestic vision of God's glory in the temple. And this encounter totally transformed Isaiah's life as he heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah responded with a surrendered heart saying, Here I am God, send me. Isaiah's vision was not just awe -inspiring, an awe-inspiring spectacle. It was a call to mission and service. And God's vision often leads us to a deeper commitment to his purposes and a willingness to be his ambassadors in the world. In the New Testament, you also have Paul's vision on the road to Damascus where God shows up and it's like a blinding light and, and he hears the voice of Jesus. And this, obviously, this moment in Paul's life, we've been looking at him in the book of Acts, uh, marked a radical transformation and outlook in his life. He was Saul at the point he was blinded by God, but we know he goes on to become Paul, one of the most influential, important uh, apostles in the New Testament, like he had this mission and objective to, instead of persecuting the, the church of Jesus Christ, to actually building the church of Jesus Christ. There was this burden and this vision born in Abraham, Moses, Isaiah, and Paul to actually see a different future to the one that they were living in at the time the vision came. And so I guess today, as a bit of a premise to the message, I want to say to you that God has a vision for us as a church. God, God has a picture, a burden, that he wants us to understand and run with. And I also believe, I wholeheartedly believe this, that God also has a vision for your life individually. God, God has a, a preferred future if you're married for your, for your marriage, if you're not married for your singleness, for your, for your employment, for your parenting, for your children. There is a reality that God wants to impress upon your spirit. Because actually the vision becomes such a key tool 
when you are filled with a sense of question, is this really what God is saying? Is this really what God is doing? Because let me tell you, there will be moments in life where you are sailing and you are flying and you're like, man, how could I have ever been at a point where I wasn't trusting God? And you just think, man, I know I'm just going to be like this for the rest of my life. I'm going to choose to just be 1,000% on fire for God. And then a couple of weeks later, you're feeling the weight of apathy and you've fallen out of some godly habits. And again, you begin thinking, oh, what's the point? And it's vision and calling that actually helps us reset and recenter ourselves on the goodness of God. Now, let me tell you that, like, you know, Hollywood has a corrupt version of this and they call it manifesting, okay? And it's this idea that if I just really just begin to believe and speak, it's kind of a version of faith, but it's not, it's not, it's, it doesn't find its origin, of, origin in God. It's just goodwill thinking. But, but the challenge is, is that the vision of God, it's not always kind of like this rosy life that God has for you, where there is no pain, where there is no turmoil, where there is no challenge. Often God's call, vision and burden is littered with obstacles, challenges, setbacks, hardships. But the reason we do it is because we are compelled by the ultimate vision. What is the ultimate vision? Heaven. That's, that's the ultimate destination. Yet we believe by faith that Jesus is not returning now because he has a, a heart and a burden to see as many people as possible born into that kingdom. And so today, as we think about vision, you know, someone said to me last week, and it was, it was an apt thought, you know, it feels like, you know, when we talk about beliefs and vision and values, that it feels quite secular. You know, it feels a bit like organizational, like big companies, they, they set their beliefs, they determine their vision, their preferred future. They establish some values and the culture of the, the workplace and then they go after it. You know, and, and in our conversation, I was like, well, my heart is that I believe that actually it was God's idea. And organizations like Apple have learned to leverage some of these things that was God's idea in the first place. That actually vision is a God thing. Vision is a God-given thing. And so uh, just to encourage you guys today that like as we just explore something of the vision and that sense of destiny that God has for Sunny Hill, I just also want to encourage you in your own prayer time to actually say, God, will you, will you give me a vision for my life? God, will you give me a sense of purpose and destiny for my life? Because actually so often I think people live without that sense of purpose and vision and then we just, we're, we're just if you like, floaters, <laughs> which is a horrible thought, I guess, but it is what it is. <laughs> just big floaters, just existing, and like living through life, just going through Monday to Friday, you know. And I, even like coming into 2024, you kind of, Christmas is great, but I always say January feels like the Monday of the week. Does, does anyone relate to that? I mean, maybe you love January, but for me, I just think January is such a, it's such a sucky month in so many ways. But I've been so challenged by this because it's like, how can it be sucky when there is a purpose about my existence? How can it be sucky when God has a job for us to do? How can it be sucky where there's going to be times, days, weeks that we can capitalize as a church to see God's glory uh, or God's kingdom extended and expanded? So I just want to say like this morning that like just up front, our vision as a church is really quite simple. Our vision is this, is that God has called us to be a church that exists for the one. For the one. Now, it's really a trifecta of things, but there's one angle, really, that... Because I feel like the first two, yeah, they're, they're a given in the church. So the, the one is like, we live for the one, capital O, the one, Jesus Christ, the name above every name, the one we've been worshipping this morning. Our, our hearts and our lives are oriented towards his worship and to his glory. So we live for him. I also believe that for the one means that we are to live for the one body, the church, that we are here to encourage one another, to stir one another up, to support one another, to laugh with one another, to grieve with one another, to be the community of God's household. But it's the third aspect that when God really spoke to me about this vision years ago, that was the overwhelming burden. And it was this, that we are to be a church for the one who doesn't know Jesus yet. That that, that should be really at the heart of our existence as a church. This is bigger than Sunday mornings. This is bigger than singing a set list. This is bigger than listening to a thousand preachers that are preach. This is bigger than dropping our kids off at kids' work. This is bigger than kind of even meeting as small groups. All of those things are amazing. But to understand that the church exists to bring people 
into the kingdom of God. It's so easy for the church to become untethered from that God-given assignment that the church becomes a self-serving entity or, or a community that doesn't look beyond its own uh, position, if you like. And, and for me, there was just this burden and this vision that God gave me in a dream as I was sleeping years ago. And I've shared it relatively recently, so I won't, I won't go into it now. But like ultimately, there was just this burden of seeing many, many people come to Christ. Many, many people come to salvation. Now, the truth is, is that raises big questions about our current kind of <laughs> posture as a church. Because actually, it's much more easy to be comfortable. Actually, it's much more easy for it to be predictable. It's a lot more easy to just stay with the people we know and have already made that confession of faith. But let me tell you, there's something about when you see people born into the kingdom. It brings life to your soul. It stirs you. And for some of you, it's been too long. And Jesus has become just a whole set of religious practices rather than this earth-changing like life-changing ministry and mission of the church being about the extension of his kingdom. To that end, I'm going to invite Pat to come on up. Pat, can you, can you give Pat Singleton a round of applause? Can I have the microphone, please? <laughs> Pat, go on, Pat, you got this. Um, right. See this, Colin, how Sylvia is just telling Pat, be careful of the step. Did you see that? Did you see that? for the cable there. Okay. Pat is a legend in this house and um, yeah, awesome. And, and she doesn't want to be up here now, do you? No, <laughs> no you really don't. And, I um, have to. Yeah, you have to. Just share. Uh, yeah. Um, on the okay, but that last to that. week, four o'clock in the morning, I woke up and I know God was talking to me. And so clear, and I haven't been able to get any of this out of my head, so I know God wants me here. Mm. Uh, God's words to me were, I know that you love Sunny Hill Church, and yes, I do. And he knows that we're all brothers and sisters together, and we love one another, and we have a great time. But he said, I want you all to step out of your comfort zone. Mm. As you mm. said, mm. Uh, it's not wrong to love one another. Of course it's not. But he wants us, with our Christian beliefs, to move forward Come on. a lot forward. Come on. And he said, it, you will feel uncomfortable, and that's fine, <laughs> as I'm feeling it this way. <laughs> Uh, uh, but I have to do it. Uh, come on, I'm 85. If I don't do it now, when am I going to do it? <laughs> so good. So uh, I really want to move forward for Sunny Hill. I want to move forward for my family. I want them to know Jesus before mm. I leave this earth. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, it's so important. And God is good. He's given me this message out of, it's really weird, at a very difficult time in my life anyway. And I'm not going to waste it. I'm going to move forward and I want to tell people about Jesus. And he said, lift the veil from their eyes. Let them see the light of God. So that's what I'm going to do. And I, I urge everybody... Even if it feels uncomfortable, just do it. Don't waste time. I can't waste time. Just live your lives for God mm. and give him the glory. Great. Awesome. So good. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Amazing. You're okay, care for this cable there. Care for that cable there. Watch the step. <laughs> just rub that in there. Brilliant. 
It's beautiful, isn't it? What a challenge. From a, a seasoned believer, you know, she spoke to me before the church this morning, just says, oh, I've got this burden, just this. I was like, well, you know, God's given you a vision here. God's given you a word, a sense of revelation for the wider body. And I love what she said there. It's in light of our beliefs going after it. I just looked for our statement of faith this week that we were talking about. Let me just bring, raise four to you. Look, we believe that people are the ultimate of, um, object of God's creation. Of all that God made, people matter most. That's one of our core tenets of belief. Um, God made people, God loves people. Another uh, statement of faith, we believe in the finished work of the cross, that Jesus died so that people could be reconciled to God. Uh, we believe that salvation is uh, God's free gift to all. Uh, Josh unpacked some of that in Romans 7 this morning, like this idea that like works are not a requirement of salvation. Only faith in Christ is the requirement. Uh, number eight is we believe that the church, local and universal, is the body of Christ. Our purpose is to glorify God in worship and advance his kingdom on earth through the preaching of the gospel. In light of these statements, then, we have to conclude, like if these are the things we believe, and actually, we're, we're, we're called to be a people on mission. We are called to be a people who understand God's passion and obsession with people. You know, so much so that, like, you know, it's a shameless plug, but, like, really, um, this is a risk. And I say it's a risk loosely. I mean, no one's going to die if it doesn't work. But, like, this, this, we're stepping out in faith, even with this. We're stepping out because we recognize that, actually, we want to create opportunities where people can bring people into a place where they can hear the gospel, where they can hear the preaching of the good news. And this, is no, this isn't cheap by any stretch of the imagination, but what we want to do is we want to remind the church that actually primarily as a church, we're a people about mission. And so I really want to encourage you even now just to take the commission seriously and to begin to pray, who should I be inviting to this? There is no cost to it uh, for you. Um, you know, we, we've put this event on and we're believing by faith that, that people are going to respond to the gospel. And then uh, early February, we're going to be kicking off like four alpha courses. And so get praying into that because what we want to do is see more people born into the kingdom because that is what we're about. But I want to get to the scriptures now. I want us to look at this moment in Luke chapter 14. Normally when I speak about the vision is I get to Luke 15 and Luke 15 is all about um, the restoration of something that was lost. And I spoke about it at the carol service, that's why I'm not going to touch it today. But you know, the lost um, sheep, the lost coin and the lost son, all of which um, the shepherd, the woman who lost the coin and the father who lost the son all eagerly desire to see the coming back of the thing that had been lost. Um, and I often speak about, in that sense, the one that got away. You know, we're a church for the one who doesn't know Jesus yet. Um, but today, I, I'm provoked, um, you know, talking to Adam and just my, my brother, who's speaking at Ferndown today, thinking about, like, what does it mean? What does it mean to be, like, a part of church, a Jesus follower? And so I just want to read this to you. The, the context of Luke 14 is Jesus is at a Pharisee's house um, eating food. So a Pharisee was a religious leader in the day, and there was many issues they had with Jesus. They, um, they struggled with Jesus, but primarily it was because Jesus challenged their existence and challenged the way that they understood, interpreted the scriptures and the rules that they had built around the laws that God had given. Uh, but yet Jesus had been invited to a Pharisee's house for dinner and Jesus was eating with them. And interestingly, you know, we know it's like a, a, a Sabbath and Jesus heals somebody there. And this silences the room. This is a problem for the Pharisees because by their math, you shouldn't be healing people on Sabbath because it was like work. And what we know that Sabbath is a day of rest. And so, like I say, they created rules around the law of God. And Jesus, when he came, he ignored those rules and just broke the rules and did what he felt compelled to do. And in this instance, he healed uh, somebody of dropsy. And, and they're, they're kind of struggling with that. <laughs> and Jesus says in verse 5, he says, If one of you has a son <laughs> or an ox that falls into a well on a Sabbath day, will you not immediately help him out? Like, it's such a reasonable argument if you understand the heart of God. That, like, as soon as you start talking about your child, 
All of a sudden now, my rules are less important to me because Jesus says, listen, are you telling me that if you are walking and one of your sons or one of your animals, your livestock falls into a well, you're going to go, I would help, but it's Sabbath. I mean, maybe some of you would. I don't know how, I don't know how holy you are. But uh, Jesus says, or he's saying, people matter more. People matter to me. And so Jesus heals this person. And it says at the end of that passage, they had nothing to say. The conversation gets on to resurrection. And then in verse 15, one of the people at the table with Jesus heard him say those things, said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in God's kingdom. Many scholars believe that this person is suggesting that like, this is for Jews. Like, you know, we're so blessed that one day we'll get to eat the feast in God's kingdom. And then Jesus tells this story. It's a parable. He says, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. I don't know what that means. Like, try them out, hitch them up to some sort of plow, get them working. I mean, the way I see it is like a car or something, okay? Like, I've just bought five Porsches, and I want to go and drive them, okay? So he says, please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Like, three excuses. One says, I've just bought a field. Speaking of property, I've got kind of interest. In fact, like, the way I broke it down was a bit like this, is... Uh, that the first one was to do with, like, the significance through what I do. The first said, I've just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Like, I'm busy. I've got... I've got places to be, I've got things to do, I've got people to see. I need to go and check out this field. The, 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 the one about the yoke of oxen is like this security through what I have. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen, am I on my way to try them out? Please excuse me. And then the third thing, I've just got married. And you know what marriage is like? <laughs> Satisfaction from earthly relationships. Like there's this potential in every person, I think, when we go with an invitation to respond with some sort of excuse. And so, continues, we read, the servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys and towns and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Like, the master, who is God, by the way, in the story, sends the servant out, and maybe initially the servant speaking of Jesus, but I think by extension speaks to us, goes out and invites people who were invited into the banquet. So if we wanted to apply this absolutely correctly, we'd be thinking about the Jews, the fact that the, the, the Jews were God's people. Israel were God's chosen people. And, and first and foremost, the invitation went to them for the kingdom of God, but they resisted. And then the master of the banquet says, okay, now we're going to push the invitation out further. So we go into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Speaking to like Gentiles, like us, ultimately. And then we get on, sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. A very heavy parable that Jesus shares in the context of this dinner that they're having. But Jesus is essentially, I think, I, I, I believe, like, teaches us three things through this parable. The first is this, is that the servant is only responsible to get the invitation out. Like, you are not responsible to save people. That is a work of the Holy Spirit. You know, so sometimes we think evangelism is this big, cumbersome thing that we just can't do because the stakes are too high. But really, the servant just goes out with the message. The servant just goes out with the invitation, an invitation to come to this banquet, an invitation to be born into the kingdom. Maybe more practically, an invitation to come to church. Maybe an invitation to come to a Mark Ritchie event. Like, the servant is only responsible to get the invitation out. So it's important that we understand that. That's what witnessing means. It's not that like, hey, I'm coming with all the answers. Hey, I'm going to come and really kind of force you, like coerce you into the kingdom. No, like I'm just coming because I understand something of the Father heart of God. 
that he loves people so much and so we've got to get the invitation out. The second observation is this, is that people always have excuses. You know, I've, I've never heard the oxen one, you know, in my life. I've just bought some oxen. I'd be like, that's awesome. In fact, I could imagine George probably buying some oxen, to be honest, in between eating sandwiches on the farm, buying some oxen. I just need to go and try them out, Dom. But like, there's, there's this sense that like, people will always find excuses because actually in their flesh, they're resisting what it is that God has for them. The third thing, observation is this, is that God wants his house to be full. Like God... God's heart is so big and his love for people is so vast that actually we have to understand, and I'm not just speaking about chairs in this room or chairs in Lichet Minster, but this idea that the very reason that Jesus has not come back yet for his bride and he will come back is because he desires more and more people to come to him. He desires and he loves people. They are the object of his creation. So important for us to think about this, that God wants his house to be full. And as long as there is still a space, there's still a job to do. The dream that God gave me a few years ago was a place full of people, full of people, encountering God together. It wasn't geared around a preacher or a leader It was geared around the presence of God, a hunger, a desire, an appetite, a thirst, a longing, just to be in the courts of God. And in the dream that God gave me for Sunny Hill in our vision, there were people getting saved in the worship. There were people responding to Jesus in the moment. And it wasn't about how good church was. It was about how good God was. People were leaving the church, not going, wow, that church is amazing, but wow, that Savior is amazing. Amazing, Jesus Christ. And how does it become a reality? Well, in light of our beliefs, we understand that our, our assignment ultimately, if we were to break it down, is to invite everyone, everywhere, <laughs> every day. Everyone, everywhere, every day. I've run out of time, um, but just want to just really... Um, convey to you, try to convey to you to the best of my ability, the urgency that Pat Singleton brought that word with. That like, in her mind, how much time has she got left? Hopefully at least another five, ten years. That's what I'm praying for, Pat, because you're amazing. Um, But like that sense of awareness and urgency and the fragility of life that Jesus could come back tomorrow. So time is short and we must understand our God-given assignment to invite and bring as many people into the banquet feast. I love it. Like, I don't know about you, but when I see like a person who is far from God open their heart to God and start seeking after God, it's the most beautiful thing in the world because in that moment you know that we're not just talking about an upside to their life in the now, we're talking to about their eternal state being saved by Jesus Christ. This matters for us as a church. Coming back to um, uh, um, this guy over here, let me get his face up for you. Coming back to Nicholas Winton. Like I say, his story went under the radar. I'm going to invite the band to come up as well. His story went under the radar. But his journal made it into the hands of a journalist in about 1980s. And his journal had records of all these children he had found homes for. He had no idea what had happened to these kids after the war. His hope was always that they would ultimately be united with their parents, but the trouble was pretty much all of these kids' parents and families had been killed in concentration camps, and so they had remained in Britain. All of these children that he had rescued from the clutches of Nazi Germany um, were, were parentless. And the story in the 80s, and you can look at it at YouTube uh, when you get home, the story is picked up by a TV show. I don't know if you guys remember this TV show. I think I remember the back end of it, but it was called That's Life. Does anyone remember that? Esther Ranson, do you remember her? The legend that is. And there's a point in the show where Esther Ranson, who's the host, talking about one of the children he had rescued. So he's sat there on the front row in this television studio with about four, 500 people or so, and then reveals to him that the lady sitting next to him in the audience 
was one of the children that he rescued. And as he kind of is made aware of that, there is this sort of like this breaking moment, and you can see it on YouTube, starts bawling his eyes out because it's like, for the one. You know, if all I did was just for this one, then my life was not in vain. Now, it's pretty cool because as they're crying together, this woman and Nicholas, they're, they're hugging. He's an old man at this point. I think he's in a wheelchair. They're hugging. And it's pretty crazy because then Esther Ranson uh, says to kind of the audience, she says, if there's anyone else in here tonight who lived because of this man, then stand up and everyone in the audience wow. stood up. Amazing moment. Hundreds of people who were directly impacted. In fact, they reckon that by proxy, he, he saved about 1,800 children. Like 693, I think he was primarily responsible for. But obviously had, oh no, over 6,000 people, sorry, because of his bravery and tenacity and his relentlessness. And for me, I just get that sense of one day, just like Pat Singleton was saying, one day, standing before God, the mass of the banquet, and it's not about my pride and it's not about my ego. It's about understanding that I served a cause greater than myself. Standing before God and this moment of realization that if you had not lived your life for me, this person, this person, this person, and this person, this person would not be here now. Now, I know that feels quite weighty and it is quite weighty. Because ultimately, it's the work of God. But really, what I just want to impress upon you today is that burden and desire to understand. Let us make our lives count for the glory of God and the building of people. As Pat said, to get uncomfortable. What she said out there to me was this idea like it feels like it's going out of control. Like there's this desire in us to just control and to be like, and to be like just understanding what we're doing and like to be really comfortable but the Holy Spirit's word to us this morning is this idea like to receive a vision of something greater to receive a vision that is more tenacious to receive a vision that speaks to the reaching and rescuing of the many